she, just like myself, was a part of NHC San Francisco, except she served in 2020 and was a food security program coordinator at Clinic by the Bay. And Cindy, do you want to take it away and talk about what you're doing now? Yeah, thanks, Jasmine. Um, hi, everyone. Um, again, like Jasmine introduced, uh, my name is Cindy, pronoun she, her. Um, I was born and raised in the Bay Area. Um, and so, um, yeah, like I think serving in San Francisco was a huge honor and privilege just to get to know like the community that I um, grew up kind of seeing and um, kind of being exposed to. And since um, I went to undergrad in Rhode Island at Brown, um, so a long ways away from California, and then I returned for two years um, to between med school and um, my undergrad. So the first year was um, through doing um, a service term with NHC San Francisco at Clinic by the Bay, where I managed a food security program um, by like managing a food pharmacy and several different um, initiatives that the clinic had during the pandemic. Um, and then the second year, I did some research um, on those food security programs at the Department of Public Health in the city. Uh, and I just finished up my first year at Harvard Med. So happy to answer any questions about kind of that process. And actually, initially, I um, entered undergrad with the intention of doing public health related work um, and focus, um, but then eventually switched to medicine. So also happy to talk about that. Okay, hey, our next panelist is a recent alum and also a recent NHC First Gen alum, Yasin Tadari, who was an NHC Central California service member um, and was a vaccine ambassador at Wellspace Health. And now he's gonna be a first year med student at UMICH. What's up y'all? So um, thanks for the introduction. Um, so my name's is and like Aliza just mentioned, I was born in San Francisco, um, which seems to be a common theme to just be from California. Um, but I actually moved to the Middle East when I was about seven years old. I lived in Qatar for about 10 years. And I spent a lot of time in Algeria, which is where my family, like my entire family is from. And so I saw a lot of lifestyle related illnesses like diabetes, hypertension in my own family, not just because of a lack of resources, but a lot of gaps in healthcare education. And that was what motivated me to pursue a degree in human biology, which is what I did when I came back to California when I was about 17. I went to a community college first in Sacramento and I transferred to UC Merced. And um, I decided to take a couple of gap years and spend one of them with NHC as a vaccine ambassador and health educator at Wellspace Health in Sacramento. Um, and I just helped run a lot of vaccine hesitancy related programs. So like I give a lot of presentations to medical assistants and health educators about how to talk to patients who were vaccine hesitant and just like the history of it, best strategies in approaching them and just meeting them where they're at. I, my second gap year, I kind of just vegetated. <laughs> I got into med school and I just relaxed for a few months. But I'm starting at UMICH in about a week, and I'm planning to get involved in a lot of health literacy-related activities and a lot of mentorship initiatives, too. So, Cindy, I'm going to take you up on that advice for sure. And our next panelist is Jess Hughes. She was an NHC Philadelphia service member during 2017 to 2018, and she was a patient navigator at DVCH. Do you want to take it away and let us know what you're doing now? Sure. Yes. Uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, so I, I feel like, you know, like the elder millennial, but I feel like the elder NHCer here, um, given that my service year was a few years before a lot of our panelists and my fellow panelists. Uh, I'm currently the CEO at Meds. We have a very long name to our health center. Um, so we just go by Meds. Uh, I actually did two years in AmeriCorps. Um, I did my first year with um, NCCC FEMA Corps and then realized how much I loved service and had a passion for um, giving back. And I don't know if I call my upbringing like super fortunate, but it was certainly more fortunate than those who had just had their lives like rocked by a hurricane or had grown up in, in deep, you know, urban poverty. So um, that led me to being employed by DBCH for quite some time. 
And then I recently took over um, from a retiring CEO in Erie, PA, so the opposite end of the state, as CEO of MEDS. Uh, we specialize in refugee and immigrant healthcare. And I'd say I have a background um, international business and I have my master's in public health. So a combination of the two, as well as living abroad a few times has given me a good perspective in terms of uh, the work that we're doing at MEDS. However, if there are any of you on the call who are like, I have no idea what I wanna do. I graduated with my degree and now I'm in NHC or just finished NHC. I was definitely in that boat. Um, and I'm happy to talk about with you, even personally, um, you know, kind of my journey and that that's not always a straight line. It's not always a straight path. I'm happy to be here. Okay, great. Thank you so much to all of our panelists for introducing ourselves. And now we'd like to jump into a handful of questions that we have for all of you in hopes that you'll share your wisdom with our current members. Um, the first question being, what resources or support systems have been instrumental in your journey? And you guys can answer this in any order or if anyone has particular insights. Oh, is, it, is, it, is it possible that we can stop sharing the screen while we talk just so we can see each other? Yeah, sure. It might help with the interrupting of people. I'm happy to answer this question first, I suppose, since I'm off of mute. Um, I'd certainly say AmeriCorps was a huge supporter. Um, in all seriousness, my therapist was a huge supporter. Um, my partner, my coworkers. I certainly, I treated my position with DBCH not as like, oh, this is like something that I do in a year and I chuck a box, yay me. I gave back, pat on my back, whatever. Um, I definitely treated it like, my future depended on it. And I found that like, I, I made the, I made the choice to establish relationships with the people that I was working with every day, because ultimately we were serving the same people, regardless of what our titles were, who paid our paychecks, living stipend, excuse me, AmeriCorps. Um, I heard you all get paid more now. I'm a little jealous. Um, so yeah, those, that was, that was my support system. I'm going to, I'm going to popcorn this to Allison. I like the popcorn system. <laughs> okay. Um, great. Um, for me, mine was a little bit more, um, I mean, very similar people in my life also helped me um, and was instrumental in my journey. But candidly, I feel like my parents were not part of that. I think, um, and, and I think this is something that can be answered in a different question I saw, but I think my parents were very confused about my journey. And so that was something I struggled with. So a lot of my friends, my professors, um, my colleagues, um, my roommates were pretty much my supporters. And they were like, you know, they were the ones who saw me come home every day from NHC and knew what I, what I was doing and why I was doing it. So that helped me a lot. Um, especially the people in my NHC cohort too. So they were my friends. They were my colleagues. They were also people I was, you know, talking about all this stuff we were learning in NHC and at our sites, um, even offline. Yeah. Like, sure. We had our monthly meetings and we would have cool educational programs, but even when we would hang out on the weekends, we'd be like, you know, venting about how like hard being at a nonprofit, hardly being paid was. And it was such a nice, like, it was kind of weird because, you know, you bond with people, especially when you have something to vent about. And I think we all loved NHC and it was also really, really difficult um, service year to go through. Um, so that was a really good place to be able to share my experiences with. I'm going to pop corn to Yasin. All right, so this is a great question. I'm just gonna read it again to make sure I'm answering the right question. Um, in terms of a support system, I think I've had different support systems at different points of my journey. Um, like when I was trying to figure out being pre-med was and how do you get into medical school? I think 
my professors were a huge support system when I figured out that, oh, they're not going to bite me if I reach out to them. They're here to help us. Um, definitely my classmates. Um, and I think the best resource were the upperclassmen who just been through the processes that I was going through, like who just taken OCAM or who had just applied to medical school because they understand the struggles of being a student, trying to balance a ton of different things, but also being new about the current state of what was going on. So their advice was really, really in date. In terms of when I was at NHC, I think first gen, the first gen initiative was super helpful because there were people that were going through the exact same thing from the exact same background who could relate to the struggles that I was having with, again, you know, like not being paid a super big stipend or some bureaucracy stuff that happens at nonprofits. And so it just felt great to come together once a week and just vent and get it out of our systems and then go back the next week and know we have this day that we can just talk crap and, uh, you know, come back to work the next day refreshed. But Cindy, I think you're up. Dang, I feel like a lot of people have already echoed a lot of the different resources and support systems that have also um, been really uh, key to my journey as well. Um, I'm just going to echo a few of them. I think um, like Yassine just mentioned, I think people who um, who went to my undergrad and like were older than me, um, who had just gone through what I was about to go through and who had gone got through it before me were incredibly um, supportive. And I think I really got a better sense of what to expect from them. And I think um, similarly echoing the cohort at NHC, like I think that was also an important place to really um, speak with a lot of um, colleagues and also friends who just also understood a very unique experience that not many people um, post-grad really can share about, can share with. And I think that even that can continue a very long way. Um, like I just found out a few days ago that someone from my cohort is actually coming to Boston um, for his MPH. So I think that network just like continues to give um, even after the program ends. Um, I think something that I will touch on um, that I don't think has been mentioned are like professional mentors. So people who throughout the journey, whether they're research mentors or whether they're like even mentors in NHC, like my program manager, Manager was one who I um, really connected with during my service year and really felt comfortable sharing a lot of my struggles um, with her because she had actually managed um, a the AmeriCorps program um, before it became NHC. So, um, and I think even through NHC, um, through working with the Department of Public Health, like finding different mentors throughout that space was um, really helpful, not just to figure out like what I wanted to do for like the next step, but really just to see like what kind of work did I I want to do past NHC? Um, and how did I want my, how did I want to take the lessons that I learned, even if it may not be the exact same work to, to be applied in all the other different ways in my, um, in my career. So um, yeah, those are a couple other ones. Thank you guys so much for all of your answers and your insight. Um, I think we're going to just start reading off the questions and then putting them in the chat so we can just all see each other. So the next question is, what was the role of NHC in shaping your journeys? Were there any lessons that you learned that still stick with you? I'll start. Uh, I think the uh, NHC, I can, I attribute my career to NHC. I, I truly do. Um, I think without this program, I was very new to public health. I had done the previous year working with FEMA and the FEMA core program, and that introduced me to public health um, on a broader scale. And, and NHC really brought it down to community health. And I think that's eventually what led to me getting my MPH. Uh, the lesson that I learned is we have so much to learn. Um, even, you know, and, and it changes too, right? Like, my patient population at DVCH, I know this is irrelevant to those of you who are not in the Philly area, but like DVCH on Fairmount is a historically black population, low income, you know, historically underserved. Um, and then when I was hired by DVCH, I got switched to our Maria location, which was predominantly Puerto Ricans. And then I came to here to Erie and we specialize in refugee health. So I see patients from every corner of the globe. So the things that felt so difficult working with 
a population who natively spoke English and maybe didn't have high health literacy, but were born and raised in Philly, right, is a completely different situation than something, someone coming after their dental clinic that they owned was bombed by Russia in the Ukraine, right? It's like, it's a completely different situation, have completely different needs. And it has been very humbling. The entire experience has been very humbling um, because you just realize how ignorant as human beings we are, right? And I don't mean like as Americans, I mean like as human beings. Um, so that that is my biggest lesson learned is we have a lot to learn. This is exciting. I'm gonna pass this now. Uh, Cindy, it's going back to you. All right, thank you, Jess. Um, I think NHC is one, when I look back, I was actually recently just thinking back to like where I was like even like a year ago or two years ago, like just um, in terms of like where I wanted to go moving forward. Um, and I actually really, NHC was one of, was truly not on my radar um, in the sense that like coming out of post like coming out of graduation I graduated the year of COVID and I had originally intended to not come back to the Bay um, for post-grad related um, work but everything just got like completely canceled because of COVID and so I remember just coming home and kind of reflecting on like what I actually really wanted to spend my time doing because in a way like those plans that I had originally kind of created for myself had just come like tumbling apart, which is fine now in retrospect. But um, I think I really, I I think I mentioned this before, but I had always been interested in public health, but then ended up switching more towards more clinical work and um, more of an individualized approach. And I found when I came across an HC, um, I was really interested in kind of seeing how that intersection of public health and medicine would work. And um, I am so grateful that I did because I think um, in a similar like way to what Jess mentioned, I think uh, the work that I did with NHC, I think has really shifted my career lens and career focus um, towards more um, community-based work um, eventually. And um, I think the other, I think a couple of lessons that I realized, I first off, like in school, I think we're like, we can take as many public health classes as we want, but that firsthand experience of having to coordinate services or actually, or I say actually speak with people, like actually speak with patients rather than refer to them as this like third party ambiguous like group is it's, it's, it, it requires so much humility and so much um, like, like just mentioned also to learn um, about the people that who were serving. And um, so I think that firsthand experience is something that I, um, that a traditional education just could never give. Um, and the other thing that I really took away was that public health and medicine and all these things that we want to do for the world, like really don't exist in their own bubbles. Um, they require a lot of coordination and require a lot of negotiation with a lot of different financial stakeholders, bureaucratic stakeholders, a lot of different kind of hoops that we also need to kind of navigate through and learn how to coordinate with. And um, I think that was something that firsthand doing is like, can be really challenging in the moment. But I think now looking back, um, I think helps it helps with giving a bigger perspective on what can be done and what should be done. And um, in, in ways that um, I think are, yeah, in ways that are um, exciting. And um, I don't wanna say realistic because I think realistically there can be a lot of different things that can be changed, but, um, but yeah, we don't exist in a bubble. We really have to work with each other. It's very much a team effort. Um, I'm going to popcorn to Allison. For me, NHC was also really, really played a really big role in my life in my career journey. So I had planned on having a gap year right after I graduated from college, but I didn't really have anything lined up. I kind of just used it as time back to myself so I could really explore what I wanted to do with public health. I wasn't even sure if I wanted to get a master's or if I wanted to dive into a job. I think um, from firsthand experience, I realized that even having a bachelor's was very, very difficult to get a job. So I was like, oh, wow, master or a master's almost seems like the default now. You know, it's not impressive to have a bachelor's anymore, unfortunately, or it seemed like that in my opinion. So I tried uh, you know, applying for jobs, it was really difficult. So I was like, okay, let me just 
figure this out. And during my gap year, I did take that time again to rest, to travel, to see family, to see friends, also to work. But something kind of just like, I don't know, just landed in my lap. And it was kind of one of those things where, wow, this was this is cheesy, but meant to be. Um, so I actually was in a school org with someone I hardly knew. And I remember I was just like scrolling through Instagram one day, saw one of her stories, clicked it. I didn't even know I had her on Instagram. She was such a distant acquaintance. And then um, she had posted something about something called National Health Corps and how she had like a member service day thing or, you know, those whatever they call PSA or I can't remember what they call the monthly meetings anymore. but she had one of those and she had, I guess, documented it on Instagram, you know, posted it on her story. And I was like, that looks really fun. And she's in public health. I had no idea because public health, I did public health before public health was like a thing in like when COVID started. So I graduated college in 2018. So I saw this in 2018. So I was like, huh, that's so interesting. I got really giddy. And so I ended up messaging her and I was like, Hey, I don't know you super well, but um, I didn't know you were in the public health space. Can you tell me what you're doing or what you posted? And she started going on about NHC. She was at the Chicago location. And I was like, oh my gosh, do they have applications? And she told me it was AmeriCorps. And I had always wanted to do Peace Corps. I ended up not doing that because um, for personal reasons, I just didn't want to be out outside of the country because my grandparents were getting really old. So if they were to pass away, I could at least still be in the country. So I ended up doing AmeriCorps instead. And I got in and um, it was everything I imagined and more. I mean, it was a dream. So also there were a lot of challenges and adversities, but it was like r- such a cool opportunity. Um, and some lessons I learned that still stick with me. There's so many, but I think one that I like let really clicked was that, you know, I think Yassine mentioned this earlier, but meet the patient where they're at. I never really understood that until I was in NHC because we had to work with patients and community members so much. I also had to learn a really, really hard way that people have a choice. So even if I wanted people to do better for themselves, if someone doesn't want help, you have to let that go and they can make a choice for themselves. And um, I've applied that lesson in all areas of my life. And I've seen a lot of peace after, after accepting that. So that was a big one for me. Um, I'll pop over until you seen. So NHC was actually huge for me in that it was a pretty low time of my life with, again, med school applications. It feels like I just talk about med school at this point, but, um, with med school applications, um, it was like a really difficult time, but, and I, I'm usually a really goals oriented person, or at least I was. And so I kind of just came into NHC with this mindset of, I want to do health literacy. Let's educate some people. And what I ended up finding out is it's a lot longer. It's a much longer process than that. Like Allison just mentioned, you have to meet the people where they're at. Um, and so what I ended up learning to do was to enjoy the process and enjoy the people that I was with because everybody that I was surrounded by at the community health center I was working at and the leadership at NHC central California were like super passionate, super kind. And they just, they knew a lot that I didn't know that I could learn from. And so I think amongst other things, NHC has taught me to, just stop and smell the roses and enjoy the process of where you're getting to. And that makes the end goal that much sweeter instead of just let's hop on to the next thing. In terms of any lessons that I learned, um, so I, I learned as somebody that's hopefully going to be treating patients in the future, you know, as a health educator, as a vaccine ambassador, I was able to talk to patients outside of the clinical space in the sense that they weren't just presenting their symptoms to a doctor. It was just talking about their lifestyle, talking about the stuff they did, talking about their socioeconomic status and what they could afford and why they couldn't do certain things. And it taught me that there's so much more to medicine than just the symptoms themselves. It's the core of them. And it's about the, like the, 
the economic and the social factors that impact that. And so I think moving on in the future, hopefully when I do become a physician, when, I'm, when I am in a position to prescribe medication and to treat patients, it's don't just stop there. It's figure out what is actually bugging them, what's the core of the issue, and actually listen to them as people and not just as a set of symptoms. I think that was a pretty powerful thing to learn. And I'm glad I got to do it with NHSA. Thank you everyone for like sharing your responses and a lot more information about your time at NHC. I know that really resonated with me. Um, so thank you. And now moving on to our next question. Um, how have you approached building your professional network? Um, for this one, Allison, do you wanna start? Allison can totally start not to interrupt, but I feel like NHC should pay us for how much we're hyping them up right now. That was all <laughs> I wanted to add. <laughs> Great. Yeah. Um, approaching my professional network. So this was something I was really intimidated by. I love being social and um, creating a net excuse me, creating a network with colleagues, but going to people who are like mentors was really just terrifying for me, but I ended up doing it on accident. Um, and then once I realized I was able, capable of doing that, I kind of just kept doing it. So when I was a human bio major in undergrad, I was very, very unhappy with my life. That was a personal choice. But once I switched to public health, I started being really interested in my classes um, again. And I realized, wow, this is actually great. And so because I cared about it and I did so well in my classes, I ended up naturally just going to office hours just to talk to professors, make sure I got the material right. And then I was like, oh, I actually have these people as like references now for, you know, jobs or, um, grad school. And that was, I know people are like, oh, you know, junior year, senior year, start doing that. But I kind of just fell into it. And I was like, oh, right. I was supposed to do this and I get to do this. Um, so I, I think professors was like a really easy way to do that. I also did not, I went to college before COVID. So I know that was a challenge for a lot of people. Um, so I don't blame you if that's a really difficult thing. I, um, did my grad school during COVID as well. So I was mostly remote and didn't make that many connections in grad school, which is basically a whole point of grad school. So, um, I know that is a challenge. I felt like I also asked my NHC director at Chicago and asked her, you know, these are the things I'm interested in. Do you know people who went to these um, MPH programs? Do you know people who do this for their careers? Can you connect with me with someone? And I kind of use those people as not necessarily mentors, because I think that's a longer standing relationship status, but um having these people as resources for informational interviews and just kind of just building my knowledge of what I could do in the industry, you know, past um, grad school, if I were to go to grad school. So friends and colleagues as well. So I learned from, you know, my NHC colleagues, like a lot of them did go to med school and then some didn't. And I asked them, what are you interested in? I mean, we probably have very similar interests because we're at the same program and here now. So that was really easy to, you know, again, uh, get feedback from everyone. So that's how I kind of approached it. And then once I was in grad school, we had a career center. We had um, we had academic advisors and they would check up on us all the time. And we would tell them, you know, what we were interested in. And they would also, it was their job to link us. I, I think in undergrad, I felt like I had to go out of my way more, but in grad school, maybe it was the grad school I went to, but they kind of uh, spoon fed me a little bit, which was kind of nice. <laughs> so I feel like they treated grad students a little bit better than other grad students. So that, that was my experience. I'll pass it on to Jess. Uh, I'm curious, Allison, which grad school did you go to? I went to Johns Hopkins school. Oh. Yeah. Yeah. Nice. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah. So this, this question was a little more difficult for me to answer. I think because it really depends on the, the situation for me. So I think my, my attitude towards networking certainly used to be meet everyone I possibly could uh, because you never know when a door is going to open for you, right? Um, but that ends, that ends up being social stuff is exhausting, especially after COVID. 
Um, so I think my attitude more now is like making, like, what can I do for someone else? Um, I feel like my, my attitude about it has shifted a bit uh, because I think when you're open to helping others is really when you make those connections that are meaningful anyways. Uh, that said, I got this job like I know everyone, not everyone, but I meet a lot of people who are like, oh, CEO, you're young. I, you know, oh, wow. How'd that happen? I'm not kidding. This happened in sweatpants. I was wearing sweatpants um, when I met my predecessor at a dinner. It was a conference and I thought I had packed. I grabbed something like quickly packing, thinking that it was like a nice pair of leggings and I had something to wear over it and they were sweatpants. So I wore a dress with sweatpants underneath them because I had been in pantyhose all day and did not want to wear pantyhose, but it wasn't warm enough just for the dress. So that was the outfit I went into dinner. So, you know, you never know who you're going to meet. Um, but I, I definitely, especially when I started my, my MPH, um, my attitude was, was more, how can I help others and use, you know, I'm not like a super talented human being, but like, what can I do for someone else that could potentially be helpful um, so I was really interested in breastfeeding and my clerkship hours, I learned my hometown, I was actually um, born and raised in Wisconsin. So I learned that my hometown was starting their first ever breastfeeding coalition. And I like found the news, like on a news, I follow the news, like on Facebook of my hometown because my dad likes to talk about it. So, you know, then it gives us something to talk about. Um, so I had reached out to them, like stalked these people on the internet, trying to find them and offered to build a website for them as like my clerkship project for my, for my MPH. Um, and I had no idea how to build a website. I was like, I can figure that out. Um, it was highly ambitious, but it was one of those things like where they're like that networking, you know, like, should I ever decide to move back to my hometown again? Like I have an entire like department of public health behind me. Right. So like building the network where like I was able to help them, but ultimately can help myself. But that wasn't the reason that I was after the work. Um, and I think that that's how I've been going about my network here in a new city. You know, I'm not in the city that I had called home for a long time. Um, I'm very new to Erie and it's very much like me finding things that I'm interested in and knowing what skills I have and then being able to contribute in a way that I find meaningful that can help someone else, but ultimately, you know, ends up helping me in the process. Uh, okay. Uh, you see, I'm passing it on to you. All right. Um, so I honestly think the most powerful thing to do when you're building a network is just ask, just talk to people. Literally, you see somebody that you appreciate the work of, like literally just email them or talk to them. Be like, yo, I'm a fan of your work. Can you just, can we just talk for a few minutes and discuss? And that's how I found most of my most crucial mentors is just talking to them. Um, and I think that that gets easier the more you progress along in education. Cause I feel like when you're an undergrad or you're a high school student, you have a lot of different people that want to do similar things. But as you progress, the attention gets more and more specific. Um, I also think that doing, doing work that you're passionate about because that's the work that you're going to give the most effort to. Like I was giving a presentation, I was supposed to give a presentation on vaccine hesitancy to like a few health educators at one community health center in Sacramento. And that was assigned by like the CMO of this network of community health centers that I was working at, Wellspace Health. And that was like, I did a ton of research. I made the slides pretty, I practiced for literal weeks. And I went and I gave the presentation and she was there and she was like, yo, this is really good. Like, can you give it again? And they ended up giving the presentation like nine or 10 times at different sites in Sacramento. Um, and she became a really good mentor for me because she was a physician and she knew like the different places I was applying to and helped me make more connections. So it's like when you make one connection, you have all their connections potentially as well. So in essence, it's ask and just put your best foot forward at all times. And do stuff that you're passionate about because that's the stuff that you're going to put your best foot forward on. And Cindy, I think you're up as well. All right. Um, I think 
something that yeah so I guess for me personally like as someone who is first gen um so just to get also give a little bit of background I'm not the most um like natural of networkers um my parents did not go to grad school um and so like did not like like when I would talk to them about these kinds of challenges of building a network they're like you can just like email people and like yes you can but I think there's also like some like there is it it takes it takes effort and it like sometimes people will spoon feed it and sometimes institutions will do that but sometimes um it's not as it's not as organic um and so I think something that I was very intentional about when in undergrad is seeking out mentors um, and people who I wanted to talk to and kind of get to know. Yes, I like emailed, cold emailed a lot of them. A lot of them also did not respond to me. But um, I think people who are intentional about a bi-directional relationship where um, I not only would they invest in me as like a mentee, but like I would also invest in like the work that we're doing together or um, or like I would invest by like exploring different career paths and like doing my work and showing up as well to kind of meet that relation, to kind of meet that. And I think I have um, like, I think two of my um, two mentors who I still keep in touch with to this day, even like years after I like finished working with them um, are people who really, um, who were people who really invested in that um, relationship and are also people who I like particularly seek that out in medical school as well. Um, I think funny enough, actually in NHC, um, NHC is again, like the gift that keeps on giving. Um, and I remember um, I actually started my position in like November of like 2020. And so my end date was like super weird. It was like September of 2021. And I was like, well, I'm like applying to med school. And I like, don't really know like whether it's worth finding another like year long position and then just like dipping and saying like, bye, I'm going to med school. Um, and so I was just like really stuck that summer of like, what do I, what, like, I want to do something meaningful and I also want to rest, but I like can't really find like a good position that will like allow me that. Um, and I remember just like off, like the, like off the bat, I was, um, I worked very closely with the um, food as medicine collaborative um, in San Francisco. And one of the, um, I remember hearing that they had been doing some um, research related, like, like kind of looking at like the effect of these like food security programs that I had managed. And so I just, I remember just like, I had like kept in like good, I had kept in good communication with them during the year. And I was like, Hey, like, what is this work? Um, that you're doing. And that ended up being my job during my second year. And so I think even just like immediately after NHC, that was like the, I like didn't expect to kind of have that connection, but then ended up deepening that relationship with um, that organization in San Francisco. And um, like, yeah, I think mentor, like building a professional network is something that I'm still kind of navigating. I think also in grad school where I think, yes, thankfully there's a lot of different people that like, and advisors that are kind of thrown at me. I'm like, this is, this is, this is a lot, but I think at the same time, it um, is another challenge and like seeking through this like web of like all these people doing incredible work. Like now, what do I actually really want to do? And kind of seeking that out for myself um, and seeking out people and mentors who are willing to invest in a bi-directional relationship. So um, yes, I guess to answer the, to go back to the original question, um, being intentional with like building your professional network. I think something that personally really helped me was actually keeping like a running document or like a spreadsheet of people who I had chatted with over the years, like people who like what department they worked in, like how I found out about their work and like what connections I maintained with them. And even like it, it especially really helped also to kind of figure out like who is willing to advocate for me for like whatever, like next job, next like um, application or things like that, not to be thinking all the time in like application terms, but it really does help to know that there is, there are people who have got your back and can speak to certain skill sets that you have and bring to the table. Thank you guys so much for demystifying that process. I know a lot of first gen people struggle with networking or the idea of networking. I certainly did. I similarly, when I talked to my parents about it, they're like, what, just get good grades. Like you don't need a network. What is that? And that was kind of the sentiment that I had growing up about it. But thank you guys so much for demystifying that process. So the next question is, how have your family's background and expectations influenced your journey as someone who identifies as first gen? Any 
And I guess we could start with, does anybody want to start? I could take it. Perfect. Thank you, Yusin. So I think my family's background and expectations impacted me in opposite ways for the most part. Um, because neither, both of them were immigrants from Algeria. Neither of them had gone to college. They both had to learn English from the jump when they were here. So their English isn't great. And so I think that made it a little bit more difficult in terms of figuring out higher education as a whole. Like, how do I even apply to college? What college should I go to? How do I get help when I'm struggling with this class? What do I get involved in? What do I actually need to do the things that I want to do in terms of, you know, go to med school and, and get involved in this specific thing, which is, you know, health literacy. And so I was online a lot, asking people online, in counselor's offices. I was scared of my professors. I thought that they were going to eat me if I asked them questions. Um, but I also think that that was a plus when I actually managed to figure it out because I do think I'm a lot more resourceful for it. Um, and I think that I'm a lot more prone to asking for help and making counselor's appointments and therapist appointments before like the trauma starts, just so I get a little bit of a jump on it. In terms of their expectations, that's why I think that's the benefit, I think, of their background in the sense that literally anything they're proud of, like when I told them I wanted to go to med school, their first reaction was, are you sure, dude? Like, that's going to be hard. Do you just want an easy life, man? Like, get a normal job, have a family, just relax, be happy. Um, and even now, it's whatever you do, we're proud of you. Like, there's no expectations on you right now. Just remain the person that you are. And so I think that that's been huge for my mental health and huge for me being willing to seek help because I'm not embarrassed about it. And on that note, I am going to popcorn Allison. Cool. Um, for my experience with my family background, so I have pretty traditional Chinese parents. So they both um, emigrated to America from uh, Southern China. So Hong Kong and like surrounding areas. They were pretty young when they came here. So my dad came here for undergrad and my mom came in her 20s. So they've been here for a, a longer time than they lived even back in China. But I mean, the generations, the cultures, everything is so different. And I don't even think they were aware. I don't think they even knew what public health was. Of course, they knew what medicine was. But public health, they probably have never even seen those like two words next to each other. So I was terrified to tell them like, oh my gosh, I can't do this whole human bio medicine thing. I just, part of me, part of me still liked that field, but I was like, I can't carry this out. I would just be living like, like an untruthful life. I just felt like I was living for them and not really living for me. And, um, a former therapist has always told me that self-care is community care. And I love that because it's basically reiterating the same thing you've heard, right? You have to have fill your cup before you fill others. You have to take care of yourself before you can have the energy or uh, show up for other people. And so I really prioritized taking care of other people, but I was like, I get it now. I need to put me first. And that also includes making the choice to be selfish and to put myself first, even before my parents or like doing something to make them proud because I need validation that way. And that's just part of growing up. And I was like, well, I feel like it's pretty reasonable. I am making a, not a very stark jump. I wasn't, you know, doing something that like wasted my college tuition. And it was something very similar to medicine. It was something that I felt like was still respectable and it was something I still cared about and I was really passionate about. And it would give me a stable job, which I think they were just worried about, again, as immigrants who didn't really have that think they were just projecting a lot of their insecurities onto me, which I used to blame on them. And now I understand better since I'm an adult. So um, I had a lot of challenges. I, they were very accepting of me changing my major, but they were having a hard time accepting um, the fact that I wanted a gap year. My dad uh, basically thought that I had graduated college, which was, you know, a big celebration. Cool. But then he was like, I felt like it was pretty rude, but he, he basically was like, okay, I feel like a gap year was on accident. You just 
finish college and now you're like, oops, I wasn't prepared. So now I have nothing to do. And so I'm going to pretend I'm going to have a gap year so that I can figure things out. And I was like, no, dad, I actually intentionally planned this gap year because I consulted my professors, people who have been in public health and um, who work in public health now. And they recommended that. Um, a lot of people, I, I, I just don't think my parents knew about gap years either. So once I kind of just convinced them that this was actually an intentional decision, they felt a lot better about that. And um, I proved to them, you know, after getting into NHC and then going into grad school, they're like, oh, that was actually intentional and it did really help. And I think they just didn't understand our field. Right. So they, they never heard about a gap year. They thought it was just to party and to hang out and travel. And I was like, no, this is actually something a lot of people do so that they can figure out their next steps. Um, and it's not something that they use as an excuse. So um, that's how it influenced me. Um, but I'm going to pass it on to Cindy. Yeah, thanks, Allison. Um, I actually really resonated with a lot of kind of the themes that you touched on. Um, I think, um, so just a little bit of background of my family. Um, I grew up in a um, Korean immigrant family. My parents came um, also in their 20s. And um, my dad, neither of my parents have pursued a graduate degree in the United States, let alone like healthcare in general. Um, and so I think when I, and I also went to undergrad like across the country, three time zones away or through, through yeah, whatever, how many three hours away, um, time zone wise. And so I think, and I barely, and I barely came home for summers. And so they only really saw me for like a few weeks or a few days at a time in the year. And I think, I think that has, I think that ultimately actually forced them to trust that trust in my decision-making, um, which I think is something that I can't, I, I know that I can't really, that a lot of, maybe not a lot of people can really like speak on, but I think I've been very grateful that like my parents have taken a step back and kind of actually um, been like, okay, like we don't like have accepted that, like, we don't know anything about this process. So like, we are going to help you in whatever way we can, but not in that area. And I think from the get-go, because that boundary was already set, I think it made it a lot easier to kind of navigate that. Though I will say like figuring out like NHC logistics and um, because I lived at home because of that that stipend is not going to get me anywhere in the city, unfortunately. Um, uh, so living at home and actually coming to a decision about what that gap year will look like actually was a little bit um, more tense than I expected um, in that they were, they also just had no idea what I was doing. Um, because I think explaining like nonprofit work, they were like, you went to a degree, you went all this, you went all so far away just to do this. And I was like, well, no, 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 please. Like that's, let's, that's, that's not, there's so much more to the work. Right. And, um, I think a lot of that, um, like a lot of coming to decisions and like, I not even like making decisions like with them, but just like including them in the conversation required a lot of like explaining and just, again, like allowing them to come into that space. So, um, yeah, I guess, um, I, from the, I was very lucky that like they have, my parents have let me kind of develop my own independence as a person and have like they've also accepted that like they just cannot like really provide in that area of my life um but i think expectations wise um when i when i told them that i was going to be pursuing medicine they were like they were just like yeah keep going i'm like please like <laughs> i like um there were moments when i hesitated and i think um of course, they were a little bit more like, you should pursue that, you should consider that more so. Um, and um, I don't know, I'm still figuring it out because, um, yeah, like I'm in grad school now and here we are. But um, yeah, I think the, and what was I trying to say? I will say though, um, something that I did not expect was um, kind of their emphasis on prestige when it came to like figuring out like grad programs and like, oh my gosh, like this grad program sounds so much nicer and more prestigious. And like, who, who am I to say that? Right. Like, um, and like be in that position. But I remember there was a lot of tension when it came down to like making those decisions. And that is something that I know my like parents are particularly vulnerable to and like myself included. Um, so that's just something that I discovered along the way. 
Um, and last but not least, popcorn too, Jess. Um, earlier, Allison, when you were talking about your family, I wrote like your name down so I could like remember to be like, yes. Um, my, I, I think I come from a much different background than a lot of my peers here. Um, you know, my, my mom was American, born and raised. My dad is, um, is an immigrant from, but from Ireland. So I don't know how much that matters in the grand scheme of things. Um, but neither of them, you know, my dad didn't graduate high school. Um, my mom, like, you know, eventually they both ended up kind of in the trades. Um, my dad did not understand AmeriCorps, did not understand it at all. In fact, he used to call me and remind me that McDonald's in town was hiring while I was in AmeriCorps. Um, so there was very little support. It was very much like, what are you doing? You've wasted your college degree. Like you were the one who was supposed to make it out, right? Like you were the one who got the degree, who made it out of the hometown. Like you were supposed to carry the family name, right? The family pride. And now you're working for like 525 an hour, like, in a bad part of Philadelphia, in your apartment building that gets shot at, like, what are you doing? Um, so that was really hard to overcome. And obviously, you know, back to our first question, like the support around you, you know, like, what does that look like? And how do you make it so that your support system can kind of um, overcrowd or outspeak the naysayers? Um, so that that was very difficult and and there was a lot of you know i i was very much pushed to be in the medical field you know i was i remember specifically i had a project in the sixth grade you had to pick a like a, a health uh, like a physician to physician type if that makes sense um to like do a presentation and i chose obstetrics because i thought like gynecology and obstetrics was like the most interesting thing in the world at whatever 12 years old. Um, and like my dad was always like, my dad would dress me in surgical scrubs for Halloween. Like I was going to be a physician. I was there. I was going to be a physician. And then I ended up getting a degree in international business, which really pissed him off. Um, and then ended up getting a master's in public health, which he did not understand why on earth I wasn't taking anatomy and physiology. And I was like, it's not physical health father. Like we had these conversations, right? And then the pandemic hit and I was like one of the few, right? Who not only had a job, but had like overtime bonuses, right? Like my company was flooded with American Rescue Plan funding. Um, and it was like one of the highest professional demands in the world, right? Like we public health professionals, we were all gainfully employed during COVID. And from there, you know, now like that I'm in the position I'm in and have, you know, I'm in the position I'm in because of programs like AmeriCorps. I would have never had this opportunity without slumming it, as my dad would call it. You know, like, thank God I didn't go to work at McDonald's instead. And my dad now says, you know, he was just in town a few weeks ago and said, you know, like, the world needs more people like you. And that, like, and he's been saying that to me for probably the last, like, six to eight months. Like, the world needs more people like you. More people who are willing to make a bit of sacrifice, right? Like he grew up in the era of like work, 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 work. Then you buy a house and have a family and have money and have your 401k, right? Like that was the, you know, and he was like out there, like not graduating high school, but he was like, I'm going to do this anyways. Right. And, and that was kind of his mentality. Um, I have totally lost my train of thought. I'm sorry. I don't even remember the, the question. I'll just end there. Support system, whatever. Don't listen to your parents. <laughs> Next question. <laughs> okay, well, thank you <laughs> to all of our panelists. Um, I do want to note that we are a couple minutes past time. So if anyone needs to hop off, whether that be panelists or audience members, you're more than welcome to. Um, all that's left is pretty much fielding any questions from the audience. But I also want to say personally, it's so comforting to hear all of your narratives and like how you know your parents were dealing with the whole concept of a gap year and everything, because that's something that I'm going through right now <laughs> um, that like parental disapproval about to head into my second gap year my parents have no idea what AmeriCorps is or why I'm you know serving for so little money <laughs> but it's good to hear that like things will get better <laughs> so thank you for that um 
And yeah, that being said, if anyone needs to hop off, then you can. Thank you for coming. Thank you to our panelists. If anyone can stick around for audience questions, and if the audience members have any questions, then please feel free to do so. Elisa, may I tell you something? It was actually something I had written down. Um, and maybe my, my fellow panelists are dealing with this too. People, like maybe not your family, but what I found, people in general, like really want to watch us fail. Like they really, they really, people get a lot of pleasure, right? Like that's what social media is. That's what like all this stuff is, right? We, we, we want to watch people not succeed. And I don't know about you guys. And this is a mantra. Like I've even been telling my staff recently, like, my God, do I love to prove people wrong like that? And that's something like to take to like, take to your parents. I don't know. Maybe this is like, because I'm a few years past like NHC at this point, like because they're going to, they're going to get it eventually, even if it takes you a second. And if they don't like that's on them, you know, like there's a, there's a balance of course, but like keep pushing, keep pushing for the decisions you've made because you know, you're a good person. And if they can't see that, like that's on them, that's not on you. Like take your gap year, take two gap years, take six gap years, whatever. Like you, you're doing something good for humanity. Prove them wrong. And then one day, maybe they'll say that the people, the world needs more people like you, you know, it, it gets, it gets better. It does. Thank you, Jess. I really appreciate that. <laughs> um, I do. Thank you, Cindy. That's my, <laughs> that's the job when you, when you get a stupid title, like CEO, you spend all day just hyping people up. Keep doing that. Keep touching stinky butts or whatever it is that people do in the clinic, you know, like <laughs> keep going. It's my basis of my clinical knowledge. Um, well, thank you. So while we're still here, do any audience members have any like quick questions? Um, if panelists have time, maybe we can shoot one or two. Um, I do, um, but definitely feel free to keep in contact, answer questions that anyone will have. I thank all of you alumni. Um, this was my first alumni panel and it's good to see some of the alum that were here even before I started this job. <laughs> and um, I'm just excited to continue this. I hope that we'll be able to do this again next year. Um, and Elisa and Jasmine have started that um, and leaving this as a legacy as a part of their, their work here with First Gen. So thank you guys again. Um, Enjoy the rest of your night or evening. It is nine o'clock now here in Philly. I don't know where you guys are. Um, well, I do, but enjoy the rest of your nights. And thank you. Thank you again. And I will be reaching out again. Um, like I said earlier, we are starting up a lot of different alumni initiatives aside from just this initial panel. Um, so if there are other things that we're going to be doing in the future that any of you um, would be interested in, including Lisa and Jasmine, because y'all are not alone, um, please uh, just let us know. And also feel free to reach out to me if you have any other questions um, about ways that you can also get involved. Um, yeah. Have a good night, y'all. This was so Thanks, good. Sharice. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks, Thank everyone. You so much. Thank you all. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night.